Hello and welcome back. This is Dr. David Oster of Oster Oncology, which is an integrative medical practice that develops comprehensive treatment plans for individuals who've received a cancer diagnosis. We add additional protection from side effects from various chemotherapies, radiation, other treatments, and then also give guidance towards evidence-based natural anti-tumor options. Today's illustrative tutorial is on a diagnosis of glioblastoma multiforme. It is a primary brain tumor, so we're not talking about metastatic disease spreading to the brain, but a primary disease. Uh, as you can see, I'm just laying out some anatomy structures here. This would be um, a cross-section of the brain looking to the left. And uh, what I'm drawing now are the ventricle systems within the brain. The ventricles are the aqueducts you could say and the reservoirs of the cerebral spinal fluid and so there is the lateral ventricles the third and fourth ventricles and you'll see a cross section looking straight at the head on the bottom left there and you'll see the same ventricle systems placed there the lining of the ventricles actually are the site of production for the cerebral spinal fluid and this is made from ependymal cells, and this is also the structure for the blood-brain barrier you may have heard of. So the separation of the cerebral spinal fluid from the rest of the circulating blood in the body. And again, these small cells produce the cerebral spinal fluid, and that fluid then circulates through these ventricles and also down through the spine. And we'll talk about the ependymal cells later uh, in, in the video as well. So if we look at risk factors, associated with glioblastoma multiforme, we see exposure, lifelong exposure to smoking, pesticides, rubber, and textile industries. There are viruses associated as well, um, cytomegalovirus, for instance. We do see an increased incidence in men over women, and women actually get a better response rate from treatment as well. The prognosis, as many of you uh, may know, is that uh, it's not very high. The median, that's the small m there, overall survival is a year to a year and a half. And without treatment, it's only three to six months. So you can see the treatment does extend life, conventional treatment that being. Um, the problem with the prognosis as well is that there's a very high recurrence rate, and that is because it's very hard to eradicate all of the remnant stem cells in the area from either surgery or other procedures that are used. The five-year overall survival is three to five percent so we unfortunately still see only a small group of individuals reaching five years after their initial diagnosis from your pathology report i wanted to share these are important pieces from your surgical pathology some genetic factors that do show and um, indicate an increased response rate to your standard care a locate i67 idh1 gfap these show increased response rates when they are present mutated and overexpressed mgmt is a real key one for your standard chemotherapy, temozolamide, when it is hypermethylated, when it's highly methylated, this is the MGMT gene, it's a DNA repair gene. When it's methylated, the DNA repair is less and we get greater response to temozolamide. Another gene, ATRX, again shows increased response rates to standard care. GLIOSEQ, it's a 34 gene assay that your medical oncologist may run for you to see if you are a candidate for clinical trials. There's so many clinical trials that are being done right now for immunotherapy. There's laser therapies, interstitial thermal therapy, as well as intraoperative gels that are done right at the time of surgery. So these can all be looked at as well. The cornerstones to standard care still revolve around surgery, tumor resection, followed by radiation, and then temozolamide. Uh, Avastin or Bevacizumab can also be added to your case. Uh, it has been shown to increase progression-free survival, not overall survival, but uh, longer periods of time in remission. Again, MGMT is something to really look at with your medical oncologist. It shows increased response rates to this cornerstone drug, temozolamide, and which is, again, also used maintenance after definitive resection and radiation is delivered. There is so much you can do to protect yourself through these therapies um, to protect your quality of life and to maintain your ability to stay on treatment. Cerebral swelling, 
is common, very much so to result after surgery and radiation. The herb Boswellia or frankincense can be used not as an essential oil, but um, in clinical trials, uh, the milligrams are known. We use, we use the full herb Boswellia. Chemo brain, we use L-carnitine. White blood cell counts can drop on temozolomide in particular. Many mushrooms can be used. Turkey tail is a great example for nausea and appetite. You can do ginger and cannabis is so effective as well. Bowel changes can vary from constipation to diarrhea. So there's so much you can do to, uh, to treat that depending on what presents. But there's so much you can do to keep yourself strong on those standard treatments. I wanted to include a section here on uh, how to interpret the response that you're getting from your standard care, whether we're seeing prolonged remission, or if there's recurrence, MRI of the brain is your standard imaging tool that will be used. Uh, focus on the surgical margins and microsatellite extensions. These are small areas of recurrence will be looked at. T2 prolongation, it's when the MRI signal in real time fades. And if that fade is delayed, then it's an indication that there may be residual disease. And this is something that your radiologist and your, your medical oncologist would walk you through. There's also permeability studies that are done. And when we see recurrence, small initial blood vessels develop around those sites of, of regrowth. And those vessels are usually very delicate and fragile, and they actually are more permeable than your regular blood vessels. And when we see permeability increased locally in the area, usually around the surgical margins, then it's an indication again that we may see residual disease. The ependymal cells, which I mentioned before, that make the cerebral spinal fluid as well, um, when they show enhancement, this is again in the lining of the ventricles, then it's another sign that there may be some residual disease and some recurrence in the surgical bed. Augmentation of treatment. Um, Temozolamide, radiation therapy. This is from trials. So this is from trials that are done in animal studies. There are a few in, in um, human trials as well. And the main go-tos that we use to bolster and try to get more out of your standard cares, uh, curcumin, resveratrol, baswellia, EGCG from green tea, melatonin, all of these have evidence that they can be added to your care safely and hoping to get more from your standard treatments. Standalone anti-glioblastoma multiforme natural compounds that can be considered. Always we want to turn to evidence and to see the quality and the amount of the studies that are done. Curcumin, for instance, has over 70 studies. And uh, we actually see in patients that it has been seen to be concentrated within the tumors of GBM cases, which is encouraging. We know that when we take it orally, it's actually getting to the site of disease. Others to consider with evidence would be, again, green tea extract, boswellia, resveratrol, quercetin, berberine, I would put on a second level with fucoidin, CoQ10, cannabinoids as well can be considered. Any natural compound that's being thought of being added to a case should be reconciled with all the medications you're on and, of course, to your particular case. For instance, cannabinoids with temozolomide, there's an indication that perhaps they should not be used as an interaction. Uh, epidermal growth factor receptor positive cases as well. Ketogenic diet has evidence. It's often considered in GBMs and, and brain primary cancers. Intravenous vitamin C, however, and DCA have failed to show any type of benefit in glioblastoma multiformes. Um, and so um, those are not really recommended. How, that being said, uh, we throw everything at it we can that a patient can take on, of course, with the prognosis we want to use all we can to push back against the disease. So often it's a, it's a combination of a lot of those, those supplements listed there. So I hope this was a good summary. And I really want to encourage anyone listening who is dealing with a diagnosis of GBM, there can be a heaviness that comes with such a diagnosis because of the prognosis. I just want to encourage you that there's so much you can do to support yourself through your standard care and actually add a lot of additional pieces to get a better response. So if you have more questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us here at Oster Oncology.